Hello everyone. I bet you didn't know I had these glasses. Uh, I also think my hair is starting to look a little bit like my high school yearbook photo. But before we go any further, I want to talk about perspective. Uh, if you haven't seen the first installment of this two-part series on doing projects, watch that one first. It's 20 minutes of pure bliss, trust me. We're in the middle of a pandemic, and I think the pandemic is a good reminder about perspective and not getting too self-centered about our own photography. The vast majority of people in the world are never going to care about our photography projects, and the pandemic should be a good reminder of that. So our goal as creatives is to come out of this pandemic better, more intelligent, more helpful people than we were when we went in. So just keep that in mind. The work that I'm going to show you throughout the duration of this agonizingly long film is from Sicily. And this was a project done, I think I started it around, in the, somewhere in the late 80s and ended in the early 2000s. I think I made four trips to Sicily. These pictures were made and this project was made, as well as many other projects during that same time. This was made during a time in my life where I didn't do anything else but photography. I had turned off every other hobby I had and I only thought about and did photography. I'll probably never be in that space again, and I don't necessarily think it was a, a healthy space all around. It was good for my photography because I produced the best work I've ever produced during that time frame. but my life was not well-rounded. I was a one-trick pony. I just did photography. I just thought about photography. That was it. Now, I'll probably never be there again, but my life is much more interesting now than it was then. Something else to keep in mind. But before we go any further, I need to thank a couple of people because I have a ton of stuff we're gonna go through, 13 different ideas that might be helpful, but I have to lay some foundation here. So th this project is about Sicily. The reason I was in Sicily is uh, someone I mentioned yesterday in the, in the first film, Sarah Terry. So I met Sarah Terry in the late 90s in Los Angeles. She had been a very accomplished writer for many years and she was just getting into photography. And a mutual friend introduced us, and she had been to Sicily the year prior, and she, the work that she brought to show me was from Sicily, and I was blown away. I was like, where is this? What is happening here? This looks remarkable. And she was the one that said, hey, we should go back, you should go with me, let's go to Sicily together. That's what got the ball rolling. The second person I need to thank is a guy named Giovanni Mata. And Giovanni is a former photographer in Sicily that is really funny. He's one of the funniest people I've ever, ever met. Great photographer but also is from Sicily and was able to basically lay the groundwork for us to get in position to make these photos. Without Giovanni, I simply would not have any of these photographs. So I have to thank him. And for all the projects I did during that time and the projects that I'm doing right now, there's always a Giovanni Mata or two or three or four of these people that are helping you get access, that are making calls for you, that are securing data, information, locations, times, etc. You really need these people often to get to get these, and plus it's just a blast to work with them. I, I can't look, think about him without laughing. The project that, that I'm showing you is about religion and it's about faith, right? I am not a religious person. The reason I'm interested in this project, in this story, is that I'm not, I would never class, classify myself as a person of faith, but I am fascinated by people that have faith. That's what I found intriguing. I could have done a project about religion in Italy, right? And tried to do the whole country and the Catholic church and all this stuff. But what I chose to do was to, rep I, to, to find something that represented the concept of faith that was singular, a story that had edges and boundaries that I could focus on. And that was religious processions in Sicily. That's why this project made sense to me. So I'm encompassing a much broader topic with one little narrow thing. And that's, a, I think, a concept to keep in mind, which we're gonna touch on more later. For you gearhead geeks out there, and I know, don't even try to deny it. For the people who just want to know about idiot things like this, this giant howitzer of a lens, this is for you. At the time, I don't know anybody that was really shooting digitally, uh, except outside of wire service photographers at the time. Most people were still shooting film. So I was using two Leicas, two lenses, a 35 and a 50. And what I would do, and then one year, like an idiot, I went back with a Pentax 645. I don't know why I did that. It was idiotic and stupid and I did it anyway because I'm dumb and I make stupid mistakes. And that still applies to today as well. I would typically go with about 40 rolls of, of T-Max 3200. That was the film I was shooting exclusively for about a 10 year period. No matter what time of day, what lighting conditions, that was the film I shot. I typically had about 40 rolls of film, two lead bags. I would leave most of the film in whatever little pension we were staying at and then I would go out with a small number of rolls, shoot those during the day. I always had a notebook 
I always had my journal with me and I wrote a lot of notes. Now, the funny part is people always ask, do you go back to these notebooks? I was actually gonna do something with this project about a year and a half ago with a designer out of Australia. We were gonna do this very cool small run art book. We ended up not doing it. I had to go back to my journals from the trip to get conversation and detail and I couldn't believe how extensive my notes were. And also I didn't remember, but I had done all kinds of drawings as well. And I can't draw at all, but somehow I had channeled some other inner artist and been able to, produ been able to produce it. So the journal is an integral part of what I'm doing. Now we're gonna move on to the tips here. This is, you've decided you've got a project idea, you've got a story idea, and you wanna go in the field and start working. And again, I'm watching my timer here because I don't wanna to have to do this film seven times because otherwise I'll quit YouTube tomorrow. I have an unofficial tip first that's gonna get you fired up. So you have, to, you have to watch one or both of these movies. You have to watch Under Fire with Nick Nolte from 1980 whatever, and you have to watch Salvador with James Woods from 1980 whatever, both about wars in Latin America, Nicaragua and El Salvador to be exact. Um, these are the quintessential photojournalism movies, and uh, even if you're doing a project about your neighbor's garden, you will come out in fuego. You will come out with your hair on fire after watching these films. That was my unofficial tip. Now we're moving on to the official tips, and there's a ton of them. So maybe get a, get a drink, not, a, not an alcoholic drink, it's 8.22 in the morning, but just get some water and some, and some dehydrated food and settle in. All right, number, point number one is if you've never done this before, and even if you have, set realistic expectations. That is, that is a quintessential part. Before you, get in, before you even get started, you have to say to yourself, look, this is difficult, right? I can't, I can't get too worked up about this. I just have to go and start, and I'm gonna start slowly. Remember yesterday's tip, you're not in a hurry. So set realistic expectations, don't get too worked up. I'm gonna give you another film analogy. For those of you who love Westerns, the movie Tombstone, which is, which is just a feel-good favorite of everyone. I'm gonna talk about the Doc Holliday character right as he's about to gun down Johnny Ringo, the ultimate bad guy. And he says, Johnny Ringo, looks like someone walked across your grave. And then bam, he shoots him and then he goes, oh, he got too worked up. You know, he just couldn't, couldn't shoot when he needed to. We all do that with our, with our cameras. We get out in the field and we're so freaked out, especially if you have unrealistic expectations or more likely today, you have the instant gratification pressure of sharing your work in real time. Someone wrote me this morning about that very thing, about how hard it is to back down from that feeling of having to share. And I told them, once you stop doing that, you will detox for approximately two to three weeks of feeling that pressure of having to put your work out. That's how invasive those platforms are, so be careful. Point number two, in my opinion, photography can boil down to three things, light, timing, and composition. And light is at the forefront for a reason. I do not photograph, I try not to ever photograph when the light is not stacked in my favor. That is why, one of the reasons why these projects take so long if you can control the environments you're shooting in and the times you're shooting in, you wanna shoot in optimal lighting conditions. In Sicily, I had some optimal and some suboptimal because I could not control the time of day that the processions were happening. Some of them happened in the middle of the night. Some of them happened early in the morning. I had good light, bad light, etc. So I was a little bit out of control at that point. But one of the ways to practice this, and this is, uh, I wanna talk two reference points here. When I lived in Orange County, California, I lived up near this inland waterway that was a protected sanctuary, a lot of birds. And I always noticed there were these birding photographers who at the time I kind of laughed at because I was not yet a master birder like I am now. And I always noticed they had camouflaged vehicles, camouflaged clothing, they had camouflaged all of their camera equipment, but they would show up at noon to photograph birds. I could never figure that out. Like maybe you want to show up at sunrise or sunset. The lighting is absolutely critical. The way to practice this is to shoot portraits. And what I do is if I'm out in the field working on a project like this and I see someone that I wanna take a portrait of, I will immediately start scouting the light around the environment where that person is. I'm looking for usable lighting conditions and I'm doing it very quickly. I can, I can assess within 10 or 15 seconds if I got a chance to make a portrait of that person where I would put them. Or if I'm not orchestrating them and I wanna shoot them in a more natural environment without any orchestration, I'm still looking for where the light is advantageous, where I can make my style of photograph. If the light's bad, I'm looking to shoot backlit. If the light's good, I'm looking for angle and direction and color of that light. Portraits are a great way to practice that. 
All right, I'm gonna back this down here and stop this camera because God knows if it's still recording. And I'm back. Okay, let's move on here. Point number three. A lot of times people bite off more than they can, more than they can chew. Hang on one second here, let me reset that. People bite off more than they can chew with projects, right? They'll say, I'm gonna go do a project on the state of California, or I'm gonna do homeless in America, or I'm gonna do, you know, whatever, religion all over the world. And you're like, no, you're not, because you don't have the time and you don't have the budget and you'll be 125 years old, cryogenically frozen before you have any chance of finishing that project. You wanna think one person and you wanna think very, very small. So for example, let me see in my notes here what I have. Homeless in America, great example. When I was in college, this was a very popular topic. There was a guy named Jim Hubbard who was a photographer out of somewhere on the East Coast at that time. And he had done this really uh, amazing project called Shooting Back, which was giving photog uh, cameras to people who were homeless and letting them photograph. I think Jim was the first person I ever saw do that. Great project. And that sort of got people inspired to really engage with this idea of homelessness in America. But I remember one of the faculty members at school saying, well, you, there's no possible way you're gonna do that, right? You're a college student. You have no money. You're getting hammered every weekend you're not gonna go and do a project on homelessness, but there's a homeless guy in the park across the street who probably represents the entire story. So why not go spend three months or six months with that person and you'll have a representation of homelessness in America. That's smart. It'd be like if I'm, my project here in New Mexico, ranching is, is, will be a part of that. I don't need to do all of the ranches in New Mexico. I need to look for the one rancher that most signifies the, the overall conversation. That's what I'm talking about. So start small. I told you before a couple of films ago, or maybe it was in a blog post, I did a project once on the intersection of Fifth and Broadway in downtown Los Angeles because I thought that was very representative of the city in general. Now it looks like gentr gentrificationville, but at the time, it was this incredibly diverse location that brought every walk of life together on that one intersection. That's what I'm talking about. What point was that? I think it was three. Let's move on. I'm gonna call this one point four. You've got to be able to explain yourself. You need an elevator pitch. People are confused oftentimes by someone who's out dedicating their time to doing a story that they will probably lose money on. I spoke about that in part one. Uh, you've got to be able to explain yourself. Most people have a sort of misguided understanding of what a documentary photographer does, and it not only alleviates stress or pressure in a situation, but it can be the single thing that gets you permission and access. It has to be concise. It has to be clear. If you can add a little bit of humor in, even if it's a serious topic, I think that's greatly appreciated today. There's so many photographers who take themselves so seriously that when you can throw honesty and humor into the conversation, people are very appreciative. So you wanna have an elevator pitch. This is what my project is about, and this is why I'm here. And what you're doing is differentiating yourself from a tourist with a camera, uh, as opposed to someone who is serious about their craft that's there to tell a story. It works, and it's critical. Okay, I think we're getting into some camera techniques here a little bit, which is dangerous because, again, I could do 50 films on camera techniques. I got a degree in photojournalism, we spent maybe two weeks on technical things and then it was off to the races going out and shooting and practicing. You have to practice. You have to shoot, shoot, shoot. I, I told you before, at the time I did these projects, this is all I did. It's all I thought about. I was either scanning pictures, printing in the darkroom, printing on inkjet, planning projects. I had little projects close to home. I had bigger projects abroad. I was a mess, basically. Don't be me. Point number five. And this is a great quote. So when I started in photography, when I got the photography bug, a friend of my father's who was an FBI agent, who was a great guy, I mean the greatest guy you've ever met, he was awesome. He, he called my dad and said, hey, a friend of mine that I went to school with works for Time Magazine in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to tell him about Dan wanting to be a photographer. My phone rings at the time, my landline, you know, telephone rang, and it was a guy named Dennis Brack. And if for any of you who know photojournalism, no Washington DC, no politics, no Time Magazine, you will know Dennis Brack. Dennis is a, is a peach, he's a gem. Dennis called and said, "Come, I'm gonna fly you to Washington DC. Or no, I flew myself to Washington DC. Dennis picked me up at the airport, gave me a press credential, proceeded to get me into the White House and take me all over DC. I shot the Naval Academy graduation. I photographed President Bush at the ceremony. I did the White House, we did all kinds of stuff. Dennis was amazing. And that opened my eyes to what being a photojournalist was about. I got back to, Cali to Texas at the time and another friend of my father's, who was a competitive shooter, not cameras, shotguns, 
said to my dad, hey, I used to be a news photographer in Dallas at the Times Herald. I've got a bag of equipment I'm not using. So he brings it to my father, brings it to us. And as he's handing it to me and I reach out to grab it, he doesn't let go. So now we're like going like this. And he looks at me and he says one thing, don't stand in the North 40 and shoot something in the South 40. Now that's the Texas way of of what Robert Kappa said. That's the Texas description of Kappa's famous quote, which is if your pictures aren't good enough, you're not close enough. And what he was saying to me was move my body. So when you're photographing, I can't stand it when I see photographers standing in one location with a long lens or a zoom racking it in and out. I don't use zooms for the most part, except for this one when I'm shooting birds. I, you want to move your body. Always move forward. I call it leaning forward when you're shooting. You always want to be moving closer, 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 closer. That's the beauty of it. Now this comes into play with things like wide angle lenses. A wide angle lens is going to be remarkable because it helps you build depth in a two dimensional image. So you can have a foreground, a mid ground, a background, etc. but you've got to get close. So always move forward. If you think you have your image, take two steps forward and shoot it again. Sound good? Okay, point number six, work wide to tight. So when you get to a scene, and the more you do this, the quicker you're going to be able to identify scenes that are target rich opportunities for you photographically. You're gonna see combinations of ingredients like light, spacing, which is huge. Um, I, haven't, I don't have anything in here about spacing, but I could do an entire film about spacing. That's the distance between objects in your frame. And you will find a sweet spot with your spacing typically over the years. Mine is what I would call suburbia. I don't like street shooting. I've never been a fan of street photography. I don't like doing it myself. Uh, I'm, and I don't like landscapes. I'm somewhere in the middle, right? That's suburbia. You get my analogy, right? I mean, come on, I'm so witty. You've gotta move forward and you gotta start wide and then you work your way in. And that doesn't mean starting with your zoom racked out to 70 and zooming into 200. That means physically moving your body into the frame. You're gonna get close to people. You're gonna get really close to people that you like and you're gonna get really close to people that you probably don't like. You're gonna get close to people who want you there and you're gonna get close to people who vehemently do not want you there. This is called navigating the space and it's not easy, it's fluid, it changes all the time, but again, practice, 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 practice. I photographed every day for 10 years before I figured this out. So don't, again, don't be in a rush, don't think you're gonna turn around and become Instagram, Instagram Sam overnight. Okay, I don't even like that guy. We threw him out of the last party I had. It's a raging kegger. And uh, yeah, he just got, he got messy and we had to get rid of him. Okay, point number seven, this is key. You want to think like a reader. You want to think like a viewer of your work and not like you as a photographer. You have to, and this sounds, again, we're gonna continue over here. We're making the link, the tough love link. You have to think like someone who does not care about your photography because the vast majority of the public doesn't and never will. It's harsh, I know. It's contrary to what you've been told online, that you are an artist or a fine artist. By the way, if anyone in the online space tells you they're a master fine artist, they're not. When you shoot a photographic story, when you shoot a photo essay, I can't believe I have to say this, you're not shooting it for other photographers. That's the online photo community brainwashing you. you if your target market, your target audience are other photographers, don't bother shooting a photo essay. They don't care. They only care about this, right? We all know that now. Your audience is the general public. They're mystified by what you're doing. They may or may not have any interest in your story, but you've got to think like them. You have to understand. Let me get my notes here. I think I just said this in no other words. They don't care what lens you used. They're either gonna engage with this work if it's strong or they're not. And so you've got to keep, uh, you've got to keep your, your brain focused on what the viewer is going to, what do they need to get through the story that you are presenting to them? Because remember, what you're after is their undivided attention. And they don't wanna give it to you because you know what? The Price is Right is on. And you know what? Bob Barker, I don't know if he's still on The Price is Right. I don't think he is. The girls, the wheel, the women spinning the wheel, the pressure, the people running down the aisle after they get called. I wanna watch that more than I wanna look at your photography. I'll be honest, so you better make it count. Let's move on here. Okay, number eight is also gear related. And I know this is gonna hurt. This is gonna be a dagger right in the heart for some of you, but you've got to limit your, your equipment and you've got to limit your techniques. I used to teach photo workshops. Um, I still 
am going to co-teach if all things go as planned. Uh, I'll be in Albania sometime, probably next year. It's looking more likely next year. Uh, but I used to teach more regularly. I would teach various places here and there, uh, both foreign and domestic. And I, would, I was always kind of mystified by how much equipment people had. They had so much equipment at times that it would completely and utterly hold them back from actually making photographs. They would spend the first two or three days of the workshop standing in the street staring at their equipment. And I would have to go up and like tap them on the shoulder, literally, physically, bup, 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 turn around and look out that way because your subject matter is that way, it's not right here. So you wanna limit it. You also wanna limit your technique. Very, very rarely do multi-technique multi projects work that well. Now the fine art space, the actual legitimate fine art space is where that has, that has a certain amount of play. Most of the time you wanna to commit to a single camera system, a single lens in fact, and then a single technique, meaning 35, 120, or, you know, 6, 6, 6, 7, 6, 9, 4 by 5, whatever it is, and just stick to it. Because most of the time when you see multi-format projects, you think to yourself, this would have been so much better if the photographer had just committed to one thing. So just do it, keep it simple, because the more confusion, again, if, you're, if your target audience is a bunch of geeky photographers, yeah, sure, go ahead, shoot 10 systems, but nobody cares. And that, that work will never go beyond that little tiny circle of geeks. If you're looking to really make a statement, tell a story, put, a, put work out into the world to say to other people, hey, this is something I think you might be interested in, then you've got to keep things simple because if they get just confused at all, they'll leave. They will not engage. Let's see here. Uh, number nine, a newspaper photographer taught me this when I first started and I still use it today. And that is when you find a scene, when you find a scene that you're responding to and you're making photographs, you want to exhaust that scene. And there's legendary stories of National Geographic photographers doing this with, in terms of um, numbers of rolls of film on one particular scene. When you're in a target-rich environment and you're seeing something and you know it's good, you don't want to half-ass it. You want to work it until, it's like smoking a cigarette, right? It's a terrible idea. But if you're going to do it, you want to tear that filter off and just smoke it all the way down till it burns your finger, right? What's the point of smoking it if you're not gonna smoke it all the way down to the filter that was not there anymore? So the same thing. And one of the great things to do is when you're turning around to leave, when you tell yourself, I got it, I nailed it, turn around and go back and ask yourself, what could I have done better that I didn't do? How do I need to look at this in a new way? Do I need to come from the other side? Do I need to look at the light again? Do I need to talk to someone else? The person who told me this is a news photographer named Pete Schwepker who uh, was in a, it's just a wildly talented guy. I don't think he's working as a photographer anymore, but he was the one that told me that years and years and years ago. And I think it's an incredible piece of advice that has helped me get some of the best pictures I've ever made. And I also saw a huge transition in this regard when we, when we came to digital photography. The second that people had the ability to see images, they quit exhausting scenes because they would see it and they'd go, good enough and move on. That's why the quality of photography, the quantity, let's do some math here. Let's do some adv advanced mathematics because I was a solid D student, probably D minus student in math my entire life. Quantity of photography went up in the digital space. Quality went significantly down because people just quit exhausting scenes. Even though they had the ability to shoot endless amounts of photographs, they tended not to. It was very strange. All right, let me stop this again and I'll be back. This is so long. If I screwed up this recording, I'm literally gonna jump out the window. Okay, so I don't know what point we're on now. Oh, this is good. Exhausting a scene, I think that was point nine. Point number 10, also very important. If you're doing a photo essay, if you're doing a photo documentary, Jesus, I never remember to reset this thing. And then I reset it and I forget to start it. Filmmaking is probably not for me. Remember, if you're shooting a photo essay, you are not shooting a portfolio. This is not a body of I'm the shit photographs. This is a story. You are creating a narrative. A narrative has an arc. Your 10 best images, that's a portfolio. What you're shooting is a book. It has a narrative, it has that arc. What you need are transitional images. You need data-related images that may not be aesthetically beautiful. They may not work on Instagram. In fact, I guarantee you they will not work on Instagram. But what they do is they link sections of the story together so that the viewer has an idea of what this story is. If I have this group of information and this group of information and visually they do not look the same, I might need something in the middle that the viewer goes, oh, I gotcha, I know where you're going. It could be a picture of a map on a wall. It could be, 
in this particular case, what I'm going to show you is a landscape. So this is a landscape scene setter image that is all about location. We don't build cities on hilltops in America. Our countryside does not look like this. This is an image that reflects place, right? This is a Sicilian countryside. Sicily was invaded by numerous foreign armies. They built cities on hilltops so that they could defend against who was coming. That's what images, that's what it would call a transitional or link image image. I'm not a landscape photographer. And oh, by the way, when it comes to sequencing, if I put that image on the cover of the book, what do you think people do when they see that book? They go, oh, it's a book of black and white landscapes, and they leave. Is this project about black and white landscapes? No. So your sequencing is critical. All right, so, all right, we got three tips left. We're rounding into form. I'm exhausted still. I didn't sleep because I was up all night preparing these high-tech notes. Oh, this is a great thing. Point number 11, circle this one. You're gonna make a printed field guide. Once you've been in the field two or three times, once you have a, a certain amount of work, you're going to design and print a field guide. I don't care how you do it. Yes, Blurb makes a multitude of options that are, work well, and I'm showing you a few of these right now. Both of what I'm showing you right now are from my New Mexico project. One is a six by nine trade book in black and white with very inexpensive materials. One is a magazine from my New Mexico project. That magazine has been specifically responsible for me getting images that I would have never gotten had I not had that printed portfolio. That is the flat, honest to God truth of the matter. You're going to print a field guide. It could be 20 pages, it could be 50 pages, it doesn't matter. What it is, is proof. The field guide is evidence of your intention. You are not a tourist. You are not a looky-loo. You are not putting your work on social media. That is a turnoff for a lot of people. If you're photographing some of these people, especially in rural parts of America, and they think that you're putting it online, again, they might think you're making money off of it, but they don't wanna be online. They don't wanna be your spectacle. They wanna be part of the project. And so when you hand that field guide to people, they will literally look at you and say, oh my God, you did this? You did an actual magazine? This is from the project? That specifies intention. That specifies commitment. That highlights the fact that you are a serious, storyteller and you're there to do something more than snap and leave. That, those people drive me nuts. Have I mentioned that? Have I mentioned how disturbing I find Instagrammers? Oof, nails on a chalkboard. Instagrammers have also made it far more difficult for, for others to work in the field because they leave a scorched earth behind them in terms of garbage, bad, pushy relationships. I've run into that a few times already. It's not just Instagrammers, but we're getting to this point, another point here in a second that I wanna make that's critical. So again, the printed field guide shows that you're not a tourist and that um, they have been uh, incredibly helpful to me. Point number 12 is print and share. One of the things that I love doing is going into the field, making photos, but then go, going home, making prints and bringing the prints back to the people that I photographed. Now, if you're, if you're super smart, you will print those in book form and leave lined pages, then give those books to the people that you photographed and say, can you, if you have a minute, write down what your thoughts are about being in this project. What does it mean to you? How did you feel being photographed, et cetera? Then you have more data that you could even scan those pages and add them into your project. But if you promise to bring prints back, you sure as hell better do it. And I've spoken to photographers. There was a very famous guy that I spoke to once who's a total a-hole who said to me, oh yeah, I promise all the time to get him to do things and that I never bring prints back and then he laughed about it, right? So these scorched earth people with massive egos and takers, they're out there, right? I also did a project once in 12 states in America. I did it several years after someone else had done exactly the same story. And this a-hole had promised all these people in these 12 small towns that he would do the same thing and he never did. And I felt the wrath because I had people say to me, uh-uh, I'm not going to get burned a second time. So if you make a promise, you better do it because otherwise you're going to torture everybody else that comes behind you. Uh, okay, and also bringing prints back can help you add to the legacy of the project. Like I mentioned, you can get feedback. I once did a shoot here in New Mexico and I printed 17 by 22 portraits and drove them back to this small town and you cannot believe the reaction. I put the prints on the hood of my truck and opened the box and the people were so excited that they had been given prints. They hadn't, in some cases, I don't think anyone had ever photographed them. They, they immediately grabbed the 17 by 22s and picked them up and started shaking them, in, in essence, ruining them. But it was done out of pure joy more than anything else. And then the wind took the box of prints and blew it across like a cornfield. So it didn't end well. Last point, you're going to, you're gonna edit your work 
and then you're going to put it in a box or a drive or two drives just to be safe or three or two drives, a box and an online storage backup cloud based G2 deep, deep storage X4 27 T42 backup support system. And then you're going to walk away from it for a few months and you're going to sit and you're going to go do other things with your life. You're going to be a human being for a few months and you're not going to obsess about your project. And then you're going to go back to it because when you go back to it, you're going to see it in a very, very different way. And you're also going to see images that you missed and you're going to see images that you thought were great, but they're not. And it took a while for you to realize that this happens to all of us. Now I'm going to show a couple of pictures here that were two years after the Sicily project. I went back and took another look and there were images that I was like, Oh, I never saw that. I should have used that. Oh, I could have used that. Ooh, that was better than the one that I used prior. So time again, you are not in a hurry. You are not sharing your work in real time. You are going out and telling a story and taking your time and trying more than anything else to find out what it is that you do better than anyone else. Again, doesn't matter if you're consumer, prosumer, amateur, hobbyist, semi-professional, professional, whatever. I doubt there's any real super high level pros that are ever going to sit through a YouTube film this long. Um, they've probably already, you know, pulled a, a gut muscle laughing at me. That's totally fine. You just want to take it slow. Anyone is capable of doing this. Again, we've been telling stories since the origin of our species, the origin of fire, and it's a huge part of who we are. This should be a fun, rewarding part of our life because we are engaging with other people and other things. We're coming out better than we were before, smarter, more well-rounded, more worldly. And as we all know right now, we probably need this more than any time in history. So have fun. I hope that was helpful. Uh, and if not, you know, you just burned a half an hour of your life. So, uh, that's it. Good luck. Have fun. And I will see you somewhere down the road.